Hi, I'm Ryan. In this video, I'll be talking about a broad introduction to parliamentary debate and what happens in parliamentary debate. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a reasonably good understanding of what parliamentary debate looks like, what happens in parliamentary debate, but also why it's an awful lot of fun and you should absolutely consider participating in it. So the first thing I'll just talk, kind of talk about broadly speaking in this video is what competitive debate is and sort of how parliamentary debate fits into that broad overview and kind of context. Then I'll talk more specifically about parliamentary debate in particular and sort of explain what happens in a parliamentary debate, the general gist of how the debate runs, and I'll also talk about the sort of cool phrases you get to use because obviously that's so somewhat important, especially given the different types of debate tend to have different types of phraseology and terminology that people will use. So first of all, what is debate generally? So in general, competitive debate is just a particular type of activity, right, a sort of thing that you do outside of school where you have teams arguing about a particular topic and they are assigned a side on that topic or they have a particular side on a particular topic that you can sort of take multiple positions on. Now I think it's important to note what this is not about. So this is not anything akin to like the Democratic or Republican presidential debates. You're not involving any sort of screaming or ad hominem attacks. This is not really an event where you can get away with just speaking nicely with a nice sounding voice and with eloquent word selection and with nice polished clothes. This is ultimately an event that requires you to be able to formulate logical, rational arguments that can convince people, in particular a judge, that your side on a particular topic is correct. So a lot of the general ways that people are exposed to the notion of debate is by watching like Donald Trump bash Marco Rubio in the Republican debates. That's not really what competitive debate in almost any form in all reality looks like, especially not parley. And I think that the sort of general thing to understand, if nothing else, about any form of competitive debate is that you're just asked to take a particular position on a particular topic and make particular arguments on that topic. So a good example of this is if you had the question, like, should we institute a policy of universal background checks? Obviously, that is a topic in which there are multiple perspectives. There are multiple arguments for each side on that topic. And what would basically happen in the context of competitive debate is that you would have a side on that topic, you would make arguments for that side, and you would attempt to prove to a judge why your side is more important or more correct or more significant than whatever your opponents are saying, right? So maybe you, for example, are saying that we should institute a policy of universal background checks. This would be an example of a sort of general debate topic where there are two clearly defined sides with arguments on both sides, and you would sort of come up with arguments as to why your side and why your position is correct. I think it's also important to note that there are a huge variety of different types of debates with different formats and different norms and expectations. Parliamentary debate just happens to be one of those types of debates. So something like PF or LD or policy, those are all prepared styles of debate. And I'll also, also talk about in a little bit one of the defining features of parliamentary debate, along with in particular world schools and BP, is its extemporaneous nature. So just as a general overview, though, parliamentary debate is not the only type of debate out there in the world. It just happens to be a particular brand of debate and a particular style with a particular set of norms and customs. So before I move on, I just want to get a couple of quick terms out there because there's a very good likelihood I'll start slipping into saying these things and I don't want you to be confused as to what I mean when I say these. The first term is the phrase round. Basically a round is just a debate round. So it's where you are in one room against one team on one particular topic. The way that most tournaments will tend to run is that you have four to five what are called preliminary rounds. And at the end of those preliminary rounds, the like top X teams will move on to what are called elimination rounds, whereby if you lose, you are knocked out. If you win, you move on sort of like NCAA style, you know, bracketed style of elimination where ultimately you culminate in a final round and you have two teams debating and you ultimately have a winner from that debate. And so whenever I say round, just think of debate round in your head. That's a sort of just like generic term uh, that really all types of debate will use. So whether you're in Congress or PF or LD or whatnot, that's a term that probably most debaters will recognize, but that's what I mean when I say round. Secondly, Parley is just a fun, cool, hip slang way of saying parliamentary. It does save you a couple seconds of saying parliamentary, so that's nice. And also, it's just a cool way of saying parliamentary. It also doesn't make people think you're talking about the actual British Parliament, which is another upside. And then lastly, I'll talk more about this extensively in a moment, but the phrase motion is basically just shorthand for the topic that you're debating in a particular round, in a particular round of debate, I should say. And the motion is basically just a phrase for whatever topic you're debating in a particular round. So based upon that, what really is parliamentary debate? So ultimately, parliamentary debate, as you can probably guess from the name, is just a particular type of competitive debate. And its sort of main features, at least the way that I would describe it, is that it is one, extemporaneous, meaning that you are only given somewhere in the range, depending on the competition, 15 to 20 minutes to prepare your side on the topic before the round begins. This is different than many other types of debate, like Public Forum or Lincoln Douglas, whereby you have oftentimes months or at least weeks to prepare for a competition. This is different than that. The sort of second broad feature of parliamentary 
really, is that you get a variety and a wide range of topics. So unlike something like, for example, LD, where you're going to debate one topic every two months or something like that, or unlike policy, where you debate one topic for the entire year, you're going to get realistically four to five uh, topics at one parley tournament, depending obviously upon the number of preliminary rounds. And so each round has a different topic, and in each round you're only given 15 minutes to prepare ahead of time. Now that does in all fairness sound somewhat intimidating, but trust me, the more that you do this and the once you really start getting into parley debate, you'll realize that there's a certain degree of exhilaration and, and real um, entertainment that comes from having limited amounts of time. But it also definitely equalizes the playing field. It no longer means that, for example, some schools can have paid coaches that can give you extremely well-written cases while less funded schools can't do that. So one of the great upsides of Parley is that everyone has a roughly roughly equal playing field insofar as you all only have 15 minutes to prep. And the last, I think, maybe biggest upside of Parley, depending on what background you're coming from, is that there's no real pre-tournament research that's ever required. So you're never expected walking into the room to have a deep, detailed understanding of the topic. You're not allowed to use any external resources like the internet or things you've written out in advance while prepping, which means that you're only allowed to use your brain power and the brain power of your partner while prepping cases. And one of the upsides of that is that means that you don't need to do anything like prepare extensively before the tournament begins. It just means that you need to come to the tournament with a general understanding of what's happening in the world and a general gist of arguments that you can make on particular topics. But I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now, I think the probably biggest question that people have is what actually happens in a parliamentary debate. And I'll cover three fundamentals of parley right here. The first is basically the topic. And as I mentioned before, in every round you get a different topic. So round one will have a different topic than round three, than round two, than round four, etc. And that topic is called emotion. Sometimes it's also called a resolution. So really the phrases topic, motion, or resolution are really all interchangeable. So if you hear someone say the topic for this round, the motion for this round, or the resolution for this round, they're all really getting at the same sort of thing. And basically your topic or your motion is going to pose a particular debating issue. And motions will always, in parliamentary debate, be written in the, in the form of this house. And I'll explain later on what that basically means, but the basic gist of it is that the house, quote unquote, is defined by the pro or the affirmative slash the government team. It's known as the government team in parliamentary debate. Uh, and the basic gist is that the debate operates from the perspective of whatever the government team defines this house as being. And I'll explain more what that means later on. The sort of second fundamental element of parley is just the nature of teams and positions. So in every parliamentary debate, you'll have two teams. You will have a government team and you'll have an opposition team. The government team will advocate for or in support of the motion, whereas the opposition team is going to advocate against the motion. So uh, sort of a generic example of this is if you had the motion, this house would abolish pardon power. The government team will consist of two people. That team of two people will advocate that we should ban, we should get rid of pardon power. The opposition team is going to be composed yet again of two people, and it's going to uh, argue that we should not ban or not get rid of pardon power. So the basic gist of parley is that you have a government team, you have an opposition team, each team has a total of two speakers, uh, and you obviously have a judge in the room, one team will be on government, one team will be on opposition, and you have a topic that is called emotion. That's the sort of most fundamental gist of it. And then in terms of speeches, there are a grand total of six speeches in the round. There are four what are called constructive speeches. There are two what are called rebuttal speeches. I'll explain that difference momentarily. And the basic gist is that each team gets a total of three speeches, two constructive speeches, and one rebuttal each. And one person on each side will speak twice. The other speaker on that team will only speak once, such that each team is a total of three speeches. The round as a whole will have a total of six speeches. I'll explain what those six speeches are later on in this presentation. So this is just as a brief warning, I know there's a lot of text here. This is the longest slide in this whole thing, so just bear with me. So probably the most confusing part of Parley, if we're being honest, is what a motion is, insofar as most people don't really know, uh, at least immediately, what this house means. And it's, you know, sometimes like other types of debate will sometimes word resolutions in the form resolved or uh, you know, it'll just state a particular topic, like the United States government should implement this policy. Parley debate is a little bit different than that in that all motions are written in this form of this house. This is, I think, somewhat intended to reference the British Parliament and the notion of the house that is the Parliament. So this is just sort of a general uh, cultural norm that exists in Parley. But once you get past that sort of general confusion, it actually makes quite a bit of sense. So what ultimately does a motion contain and what do I mean when I say this house? So in every debate, the government team, and I'll explain this later on as well, has what's called the right to define terms of the motion, which means that any amb any ambiguous terms uh, basically can be defined by the government team. 
And I'll explain why this is important later on, but the over, like the most important reason why is that oftentimes topics or resolutions or motions will include ambiguous language, they'll include phrases that could be interpreted in multiple ways, or they'll, they'll include policies that could be implemented in a wide different range of circumstances. So the government team will always have the right to define terms within the motion, and the most important term that the government team gets to define is the phrase, this house. And in particular, they basically get to define what the house is. And I just want to be clear, when I say define, what I basically mean is you can more or less as the government team equate some entity or person or organization to what the house is. So what that means is you basically, as the government team, get to pick what perspective the debate is operating from. And I'll explain what that means uh, at the end of this slide. Uh, but the important thing to note about this is that the government team, when they define the House, as the ability to focus the debate on a particular entity. And the reason for that is that insofar as motions are written in the form of this House would or this House believes that, the debate ultimately operates in, in, in the question of what is in the best interest of this House. So, for example, if you define this House as the United States government, the debate operates from the perspective of the United States government, meaning what is in the best interest of the United States government. Now, as I'll explain down here, the house can be defined more or less as any entity or institution or organization. So you could, for example, define this house as China or as the state of Maine or as the Kremlin. You could define this as more or less whoever you want. Now, one thing that's important to note is that not all definitions will necessarily make sense. So remember that whoever you're defining this house as, Whatever your definition is, you can more or less substitute that defini definition in for the word this house. So for example, if you had the motion this house would abolish pardon power from a previous slide, maybe you're the government team and you define this house as the United States government. This basically means that the debate operates from the perspective of the United States, meaning that the topic really could be rewritten as the United States government should abolish pardon power. And the debate then operates from the question of should the United States government you know, abolish pardon power, should it keep it? That's the debate. Now. Obviously, not all definitions of this house would necessarily make sense. So for example, if you have the motion this house would institute a wealth tax, if you define this house as a local ice cream shop around your house, maybe you really like Ben and Jerry's, but it doesn't make a lot of sense because if you were to read the, the motion as Ben and Jerry should institute a wealth tax, it obviously doesn't make a lot of sense because how on earth, like, don't get me wrong, ice cream is great, but how is an ice cream shop going to implement a wealth tax? And so what that points to is that you're going to want, when you're the government team, to define this house in a way which makes sense and is reasonable and will not raise all that many eyebrows. But at the same time, you can get creative. So you can, for example, say, we want to define this house as the Russian government or as the Kremlin or as the CCP or as some particular individual. Now, in some instances, as I'll talk about in a later video, this can be considered what's called abusive. But the generic understanding that you should take away from this video is that the government team gets to define what the house is and the debate then operates from the perspective of that house. The last thing just to say is a more generic discussion of what definitions constitute. So the government team, as I mentioned previously, has the right to define ambiguous terms. And this oftentimes means that you get, as the government team, to limit the scope of the debate and to clarify the terms of the debate. So for example, on the motion, this house would subsidize art that glorifies the working class. You might want to define what constitutes art that glorifies the working class. And obviously, you'd also want to define this house. So maybe, for example, you as the government team would say something to the effect of, we define this house as the United States government, and we define art that glorifies the working class as music or films or books or whatever form or variety of art that sort of glorifies and highlights the positive aspects of the lifestyle of those uh, individuals that are members of the working class. So something like that. And what that basically then does is it limits the scope of the debate. That's sort of generically what a motion does and what defining the terms of that motion does for the debate. Very briefly, there are multiple types of motions you can get in parliamentary debate. And just as a general reminder, right, the government team is supporting the motion. They're supporting whatever the motion says. The opposition team is opposing that. And the generic way I break this down is to into more or less like one, two, three, four, five, six, or roughly seven different types of motions. So the most common one, or I guess I should really say the most common ones are these two here. This house would and this house believes that. And basically this house would is really shorthand for a policy type of motion. So if you ever see this house would, you really should be thinking whatever the government team defines this house as, you can more or less substitute that defini definition in for this house. And the debate is basically should that actor engage in some particular action? Should they implement some particular type of policy, right? And conversely, uh, a motion that says this house believes that is a little bit more philosophical because what we're talking about instead is the general idea of a policy as opposed to the specific implementation of that policy. 
And so the generic thing to understand here is that you have different types of motions and those different motions have slight nuances. So this house regrets, for example, is different than this house opposes, which is different than this house prefers, which is different than this house supports. Now, in all honesty, this might seem a little bit overwhelming. So what I'll be very honest is that 90% of your debates will probably operate in these first two here. This house would and this house believes that. And these things like this house regrets and this house supports, those are far rarer. <coughs> The only one I do want to call attention to is the uh, is a sort of general motion type, which is worded as this house as X. X I'm just basically using as a general placeholder for some organization or entity or individual. And basically what this type of motion refers to is a debate where the house is already defined and the government team doesn't get to define this house. So for example, you might have a motion that says this house as the United States government would ban pardon power. This would operate the same as if you had a debate that said this house would ban pardon power and the government team defined this house as the United States government. But sometimes motions will specifically single out a particular entity or organization or individual or nation even, and the debate operates from the perspective of that house. And I just want to be very briefly clear about what I mean when I say operates from the perspective of. What that basically means is that at the end of the debate when I'm the judge or when whoever's the judge is figuring out who won the debate, the question they're asking themselves is which team better proved what benefits whatever that this house was defined as. So if you define this house as the United States government, for example, ultimately the question you're asking is what is in the best interest of this house? If you define this house more broadly as society, for example, you'd be asking the question what is best for society? If you define this house as the Kremlin, it's obviously what is best for the Kremlin. So the next thing I'll talk about in this video is different types of speeches in parliamentary debate and what each speech does and the burdens or responsibilities of those speeches. So as I mentioned previously, there are a total of six speeches in parliamentary debate. It begins with the prime minister constructive, which is a seven minute speech delivered by the government team. That is followed by the leader of opposition constructive speech, which is delivered by the opposition team. You then have the member speeches that they're called, starting with the member of government speech and then followed by the member of opposition speech. This, uh, these are known as your constructive speeches. The important feature of constructive speeches is that you are allowed to introduce new arguments and new evidence and new refutations in constructive speeches. Following the four constructive speeches, you then move on to the rebuttal speeches. There are a total of two rebuttal speeches. The difference between constructive speeches and rebuttal speeches is that rebuttal speeches are not allowed to introduce new arguments. Uh, and they are, while rebuttal speeches are allowed, as I'll explain later, to introduce new evidence, they are not allowed to introduce new points of argumentation. And in the rebuttal speeches, it begins with the leader of opposition rebuttal. This is an opposition speech that is delivered by the same person as the leader of opposition constructive, so this speech back here. And then following the LOR, the leader of opposition rebuttal, you have the prime minister rebuttal, which is a government speech that concludes the debate, uh, and that will be delivered by the same person as the PM. C. So way back up here. Now, in terms of general speaking times, the way it will generally work is that all speeches have what is called a grace period, which basically means you get 30 extra seconds at the end of your speech. This, uh, the prime minister speech is seven minutes long. The leader of opposition constructive, member of government, and member of opposition are all eight minutes long. Remember that this is really seven minutes and 30 seconds and eight minutes and 30 seconds respectively, given that you have grace time. Then the leader of opposition rebuttal, which is the last opposition speech in the round, is a total of four minutes. And then the prime minister rebuttal is a total of five minutes. Now, importantly, what you might notice here is that there's something interesting in parliamentary debate, which is that the member of opposition speech is immediately followed up by the leader of opposition rebuttal, which means that you have two opposition speeches back to back. Apart from that, it alternates government opposition, government opposition, just like that. So the general reason for this is that the government team, as I'll explain later on, has what's called the burden of proof in the debate, which means that they have to prove that we should do something to change the status quo. And so the government team, to fulfill that burden, is given the chance to have the first and last speech in the round. So the government team starts the debate and they end the debate as well. Conversely, the opposition team gets what in what is in effect a total of 12 minutes of speaking time with no ability for the government team to interject within those 12 minutes. So that is what's, that is oftentimes called the opposition block or the op block, which consists of the member of opposition speech immediately followed by the leader of opposition rebuttal. And although I did indent this weirdly, there's no pause in between any of these speeches. So uh, the prime minister constructive is immediately followed by the LOC, which is immediately followed by the MG, the MO, LOR, PMR, etc. There's no prep time in parliamentary debate in between speeches. The only preparation time you're given, as I explained earlier, is the 15 minutes of prep time before the debate begins. 
I'll now walk through each of the six speeches and just sort of broadly speaking define what each speech is supposed to do and the general duties of each speech. The first speech in the debate is the Prime Minister Constructive, which is a government speech. There are two basic things a Prime Minister Constructive must do, and if you don't do either one of them, you're already in trouble. The first thing that the Prime Minister speech should do is define the terms of the motion, and in particular, you want to define this house. So as I explained earlier, definitions are crucial in the round because they, one, narrow and focus, uh, narrow the focus of the debate, but they secondly provide clarity in the debate because you actually know what you're talking about and what types of policies the government team is advocating for, and therefore what types of policies the opposition team is advocating against. So certain types of motions will require a lot of time to be spent on definitions, and other motions will be relatively straightforward, right? So for example, on the motion, this house would criminalize hate speech, that requires a fair amount of definitions, right? What constitutes hate speech? What types uh, of punishments would be applied to that? And how do you prove that in a court of law? If you have a motion like this house would introduce a social credit system in liberal democracies, that obviously requires a fairly extensive set of definitions. But conversely, there are other motions that while you still do need to define terms in the motion are far more clear. So for example, the motion this house would ban zoos, definitions for that motion are fairly straightforward. You might, for example, define this house as the United States federal government. You might, for example, briefly explain what zoos are and the function that they serve, and then you would make your case from there. So obviously, the extent to which you spend time as the prime minister defining terms should vary based upon the complexity and the ambiguity of the motion. The second thing a prime minister constructive speech must do is make two to three constructive arguments explaining why the government team's perspective is correct or beneficial. What this basically means is, remember, judges, uh, debates are judged by judges, and those judges are listening to you and trying to find a reason as to why your side should win the debate. And the purpose of arguments is to basically explain why your side deserves the win in the round and as to why your stance is more advantageous or more correct than what your opponents advocate for. And basically, each argument that you make in the debate should follow a general pattern of having what's called a warrant, which basically means a logical justification for why it is true. Most arguments that are strong oftentimes have some form of evidence. This can be real-world evidence. So you, for example, in a debate about the Arab Spring, might talk about Tunisia and use that as an example or as evidence for your case. And then you also want to have what's called an impact. So you want to explain why your argument is important. And this oftentimes is called the claim warrant impact model of argumentation. And basically what this means is that your claim is what are you saying your argument is. So maybe you, for example, say our argument is that this reduces gun violence. Your warrant is your logical explanation as to why that is true. Maybe you, for example, say that when we institute a policy of universal background checks, it means that we can more closely determine who has access to firearms and therefore guns are less likely to be put into the hands of individuals that might use those uh, arms for poor purposes. And the impact of that is why that argument is important. So you might, for example, say the impact of reducing gun violence is that we save lives and people are able to live uh, their lives with less fear and paranoia. People are go to, able to go to, for example, school without fear of having some sort of school shooting and ultimately people live materially happier lives. So that would be an example of an argument that follows this claim warrant impact style. And obviously arguments can get in, uh, very sophisticated and complex. So for example, you might have multiple warrants. You might have multiple reasons why a particular claim is true. You might have multiple impacts of an argument. But ultimately, the prime minister should make two to three different arguments that address different types of argumentation or different types of maybe it's politics, economics, social, so, like social societal impacts. Those are the types of things that the prime minister should be talking about. And you want to make two to three arguments in the prime minister's speech, each of those arguments following this general pattern. The second speech in the round is the leader of opposition constructive. And the first thing the leader of opposition constructive should do, really before anything else, uh, is they should accept or reject the definition set forth by the prime minister. This is really just to make sure the debate doesn't sort of have any messy elements of definitional skirmishes. So the basic gist of it, that is that the judge will have written down whatever the prime minister defined the motion as being in terms of what the house is and what particularly ambiguous terms within the motion mean in the context of the debate in the government's case. And the LOC should just accept those definitions if they are fair and reasonable. Uh, I'll talk in a later video likely about why in some instances, the leader of opposition will actually want to reject those definitions. But don't worry about that for right now. That's not terribly, terribly important. And in all honesty, you're going to accept the definition set forth by the government team in approximately 99% of your debates. In general, that's not a huge problem. 
Then, much like the Prime Minister made two to three arguments explaining why the government team is correct, the Leader of Opposition Constructive should make two to three arguments as to why the opposition team's perspective is correct. Again, these arguments should follow the general style of claim warrant impact. So you again want to say what your argument is, you again want to explain why that argument is true, and you want to explain why that argument is important. And then the final thing that the Leader of Opposition Constructive must do is refute the arguments that were set out by the Prime Minister's speech. So remember that you as the opposition team cannot simply make your own arguments. You have to also explain why the government team's arguments and why the government team's perspective in the debate is flawed or incorrect or insignificant. And so what you need to do is to then, as the leader of opposition constructive, explain why the two to three reasons or arguments that were outlined by the PMC are incorrect or wrong or flawed. And this is something that I think uh, is really, really important because the important thing to note about parley debate is that first speeches, PMC and LOC, I mean, should not just be, here are our arguments. They should also be engaging with the other side. And the best way that you can do that in the leader of opposition constructive is by responding to the arguments that were made by the prime minister to allow for what's called clash or engagement between teams. The member of government, which is a government speech as evidenced by the fact that the word government is in the name of the speech, follows the leader of opposition constructive. The member of government really needs to do two things. The first is the member of government needs to refute the arguments that were made by the leader of opposition constructive. And so remember that the LOC has just given the judge two to three reasons as to why the opposition team is correct, why they are important, why they are consequential in the round. The member of government should refute those arguments by, why, by explaining why they are incorrect or why they are flawed or why they are wrong or unimportant. I'll talk more extensively about refutations in a later video because there is a lot involved in properly responding to and properly refuting an argument. But the important thing to just broadly speaking understand is that the member of government needs to demonstrate why the arguments that are made by the opposition side are incorrect. This is particularly important because as I'll explain later on, Given that rebuttal speeches cannot introduce new material and cannot introduce new arguments, the member of government speech is actually the only speech in the entire debate where the government team is able to refute the opposition's arguments. Because as I mentioned earlier, after the member of government speech concludes, you then have the member of opposition followed by the leader of opposition rebuttal. So you have two back-to-back -back opposition speeches. So it is really, really important that the member of government speech refute the arguments made in LOC because this is the first and last opportunity for the government bench to actually engage with the arguments made by opposition. So it's really important that you engage with those arguments as the member of government. The second thing that the member of government should then do is, is do what's called rebuild the prime minister's arguments. And what this basically means is that remember that the leader of opposition, leader of opposition constructive, excuse me, refuted the arguments that were made by your colleague, by the prime minister. The member of government should respond to those refutations. And so what this basically means, the way that I like to envision this is that imagine arguments as houses. The prime minister builds up an argument, builds up two to three of them actually, right? And that sort of could be envisioned as building up a house. And then the leader of opposition is going to refute those arguments. And that can basically be envisioned as blowing down the house, right? As sort of, you know, destroying the foundations of the house, making the house crumble and break down. The member of government's job then is to rebuild that house, i.e. rebuild the argument, by refuting whatever the leader of opposition constructive said was wrong with that argument. So the basic gist of this is that this is just another type of refutation, but instead of refuting an argument, you're basically refuting a refutation. And I know that's a lot of me saying the word refutation, but the basic gist is that you are reconstructing your original arguments. One thing that's really important is that reconstructing an argument or rebuilding an argument does not simply mean restating the argument. So if the leader of opposition re rebutted your partner's argument, as the member of government, it is insufficient just to restate those arguments or say, our first argument was this, our second argument was this, our third argument was this. You instead actively need to explain why it is the case that the, uh, why the refutations made by the other team are incorrect and why your arguments still stand in the round. The member of opposition speech then is the last constructive speech in the round. Later in this video, I'll talk about points of information, and that's the sort of maybe most important distinction really between opposite, uh, between constructive and uh, rebuttal speeches. But the member of opposition speech is most importantly the last speech in the round where you are able to introduce actively new arguments. So beginning with the leader of opposition rebuttal, you are not allowed to introduce any new material into debate into the debate, doing so is not permissible and not allowed. The member of opposition basically has two to three things to do. It's oftentimes stated as two, but I really like to think of it as doing three things. The first thing that the member of opposition should do 
Uh, not necessarily like chronologically, as in you could do this bullet point first and then go here, but these are the three things that the MO must do. The first thing that the MO must do is rebuild the leader of opposition's arguments by responding to the refutations made in the member of government speech. So just like I was talking about how the member of government rebuilds the prime minister's argument by responding to the refutations made by the leader of opposition constructive, the member of opposition should rebuild the leader of opposition's arguments by responding to whatever the member of government had to say in response to the LOC's arguments. I know that I'm throwing a lot around a lot of speech terminology here, like constructives, rebuttals, leaders, members, but the basic gist of this is not super complicated, which is that the member of opposition wants to explain why the leader of opposition, right, their partner's arguments are correct, and the member of government, the previous government speech attempted to prove why that is not true. The job then of the MO is to explain why the responses made in the member of government speech, the second government speech, the speech that precedes the MO, are flawed or incorrect. The next thing that the MO should do uh, is to basically respond to the responses made by the member of government. And what this basically means is that the leader of opposition made refutations to the prime minister's arguments, right? This is what we talked about in this slide back here, right? Then in the member of government speech, right, the member of government refuted whatever those refutations were, right? So if the government team made a particular argument and the prime minister constructed, the leader of opposition constructed, refuted that argument in some capacity. The member of government then stood up and responded to that refutation to reconstruct or to rebuild that argument. Now, it is the responsibility of the member of opposition to explicitly explain why the responses made to their colleagues, the LOC's refutations in the member of government speech, are wrong or incorrect or flawed. And so I know that's a lot of times in me saying refute or respond. So the way that I'm going to hopefully make this make more sense is that in the last part of this video, I'll talk about flowing. I'll give a visual representation of what this means. Hopefully that will make a degree more sense. And this is basically just defending the reasons that were presented in the leader of opposition constructive as to why the prime minister constructive speeches, uh, arguments, excuse me, are incorrect. Now we move on to the leader of opposition rebuttal. This is a shorter speech. It's in fact the shortest speech in the round. It's a total of four minutes and 30 seconds long. And the basic gist of rebuttal speeches, both the leader of opposition rebuttal and the prime minister rebuttal, or as I'll refer to them as the LOR and PMR, both rebuttal speeches are intended to summarize and crystallize the debate into two to three major what are called voting issues. This is basically a fancy way of saying that the rebuttal speeches should explain to the judge why their team has won the debate. The reason I say this is that the rebuttal speeches are not allowed to introduce actively new arguments or actively new material, which means that you are not allowed to actively contribute more material to the round. Rather, all that you are allowed to do is to use the existing material that has been put, been put forth by your partner and by yourself and by your opponents and to explain based upon that material why your team has won. Now, in terms of what voting issues are, most debates will wind up boiling down to one to maybe three or four major areas of what's called clash. And basically clash is teams will disagree on things, right? Obviously, it's a debate. You're arguing against each other. And ultimately, most debates will boil down into a couple of major, most important issues. And this is something that will become easier to identify the more you do practice debates, the more that you do practice rebuttal speeches, or the more you even flow practice rounds or watch other rounds, either on YouTube or at tournaments. But the basic gist is that you summarize the debate into those major issues. You do, you, you do what's called crystallize the debate down into a couple of major points, and you explain why your team won on those major points. So... The important thing to note here is that you're trying to convince the judge why on the most important areas of disagreement between your team and your opponents, your arguments were more persuasive than their arguments, such that you should win the debate on those most important issues in the round. The prime minister rebuttal is very similar structurally to the, to the leader of opposition rebuttal in that they are basically summarizing and crystallizing the debate into several major voter issues and explaining why the government team has won uh, and has already given the material necessary to win on those voting criteria. But the one extra thing that the PMR is allowed to do, and this is, uh, I really say this with like a big asterisk on it really, because this gets into some really tricky uh, parts of parley debate, is that the Prime Minister rebuttal is also allowed to respond to any new arguments that were made by the member of opposition speech. So if you're thinking about it, right, if you're just thinking somewhat rationally, 
The member of opposition speech is the last constructive speech in the round, and it is the last speech in the round where you are actively allowed to make new arguments. In theory, if an opposition team dumped a whole lot of content into the member of opposition speech, and a whole lot of great phenomenal arguments, it would be really unfair to the government team to not allow government to ever respond to those arguments. Why? Because the member of government speech only has the ability to respond to the arguments made in the leader of opposition constructive, certainly not in the member of opposition. The prime minister rebuttal then is the last opportunity for the government team to respond to any new arguments that came out in the op lock or in the MO and LOR. This basically means that the PMR has the ability to respond to any actively new points of substance or content that were raised in the op lock, and they are in doing in in doing that, they are allowed to basically respond with what could be considered new arguments. But importantly, it's not that the PMR is allowed to introduce new arguments; it's that you are allowed to respond to new arguments even if your responses might sound new to the round. The other thing to know about both the leader of opposition rebuttal and the prime minister rebuttal is that although you are banned from introducing actively new arguments, unless, as I've already explained, the PMR is responding to arguments made in the member of opposition speech, both rebuttal speeches are allowed to introduce new evidence. So if you, for example, have pieces of evidence that you thought of you know, while your opponents were speaking, you are allowed to put those into your speech as the rebuttals. Now, that concludes, I guess, the sort of six major speeches within parliamentary debate. The next thing I'll explain is the three what are called points that you can ask in parliamentary debate. Each point, as it's called, has a different purpose. There are points of information, points of clarification, and points of order. Each point has a distinct purpose and a distinct aim, and understanding what the purposes of each point is is quite important in parliamentary debate. So let's start on points of information, the most commonly used type of point, which is basically, whenever you see points, you can basically think really of question, more or less, although explain why that's not super applicable to points of order. So points of information, what are they? Points of information are basically short questions you can ask to your opponents while your opponents are speaking. So this is basically a way that you can have short interjections into your opponent's speech, and they are question forms. So that means that you're not giving a statement, you're not standing up and explaining an argument in the middle of your, oppo in the middle of your opponent's speech. What you are instead doing is standing up and, and asking or offering a short question to your opponent. These are intended to be less than 10 to 15 seconds. They really, in all honesty, shouldn't be more than eight, in my opinion. The more, like, once you start getting, like, 12, 13 seconds, that's really long, uh, especially given that you ultimately don't have that much time in a speech. Eight minutes sounds like a lot, but trust me, it goes by really, really quickly. The other thing to note about POIs is that they are optional, which means that the speaker that is speaking does not have to accept a point of information. What this means is that a point of information can be offered and that point of information can be accepted or rejected. The speaker that is talking has the ability to wave you down. If, for example, the speaker does not want to take your point of information, does not want to hear your question, does not want to respond to it, they're not required to. Uh, it is generally very good practice to take at least one POI, sometimes two POIs in a particular speech, but ultimately POIs are optional. So it is optional to stand and ask a POI. It is optional to take a POI. And POIs are intended to be strategic which means that you're not asking random questions, right? You're not standing up and, you know, if the person accepts, you're not going to ask what did you have for breakfast or what's your favorite type of ice cream or, you know, where do you go to high school? Those are not important questions to ask in the debate. You would instead ask questions that try to highlight the flawed logic in the other team's case and try to explain why their arguments are incorrect using a question format. So I guess the sort of most obvious question that you probably have then is how do you physically offer a point of information? And the basic way that you do it in a physical debate, right, given that there is a degree of uncertainty as of right now when I'm filming this about the coronavirus and what that will entail for next year. But when you offer a point of information in a physical tournament, you will basically stand up and in most instances you'll, you'll sort of like stick your hand out. And this will indicate that you are offering a point of information. In virtual debates, it really depends on the format. Zoom, Discord, Google Hangouts, it depends on what the tournament says you should do. Sometimes it will be you say something, you say like on that point. Sometimes it will be you send something in the chat. But the basic gist is that you in virtual format will have some way of expressing you want to offer a point of information. As I mentioned, when you offer a point of information, the speaker that is speaking has the option of accepting you and saying, yes, you can ask your point of information or rejecting you, waving you down. They can either say, no, thank you. They can say, not at this time. They can say, I'll take you later. Or they can just physically wave you down without acknowledging you directly or vocally. This basically means then that the speaker that is speaking has the ability to control when they take a POI, if they take a POI at all. 
if they do take a POI, the person that is offering the POI then has approximately 10 to 15 seconds to ask a question to that speaker. That speaker then obviously should respond to the point of information. Note that all of this happens while the timer is running. So if you, for example, take a point of information five minutes into your speech, uh, that obviously will count as time. So it's not like when your opponent is talking, it's, you know, it's not the case that, you know, time stops or anything like that. Your speech still continues. So the last thing to note is when you can actually ask a point of information. As I briefly alluded to earlier, you're not allowed to ask or offer a point of information in the, uh, in the rebuttal speeches. So you're not allowed to ask a point of information in the LOR or the PMR. You are, however, allowed to offer a POI in the PMC, the Prime Minister Constructive, the LOC, the Leader of Opposition Constructive, the MG, and the MO. The other thing is that you are not allowed to offer a POI in the first or the last minute of each speech. So if you, for example, have a really strong POI, you want to ask 30 seconds into the prime minister, sorry, you're not allowed to do that. You have to wait until one minute into the speech to offer a point of information. And the last minute, not including grace time, by the way, uh, it, it is also not allowed. This is called protected time. You're not allowed or uh, it's not permissible to ask or offer a point of information during that protected time. Most judges, or at least good judges anyways, will hopefully like bang the desk or will clap or will make some noise to signal that uh, protected time has elapsed and you are allowed to offer a point of information. That is when you are allowed to stand up and offer a POI at which one the speaker has the ability to accept or reject you. There are a couple of examples of POIs I've put in this video. Um, since uh, my computer is a little weird with recording audio, it won't record the audio uh, of these videos, but if you go to the videos, I've included the timestamps uh, in the link. So if you just click on that, it should bring you to somewhere in the range of five to 10 seconds before a point of information is offered. Uh, and then you can see the uh, how the point of information is offered. You can see the person accept the point of information. You can hear the point of information being asked. And then you can also hear the response to that point of information. Uh, as you note, these do both come from British parliamentary debate, which is a slightly different, actually very different type of format. But the, the basic gist of points of information are the same in both British British parliamentary and American parliamentary debate, which is the subject of this video. The next thing I want to talk about is different than points of information, which is points of clarification. These are, in my opinion, one of the most misunderstood or misused types of questions in parliamentary debate. So basically, what points of clarification are intended to do is to shocker, clarify something. And in particular, they're intended to clarify definitions. Unlike POIs, these are not intended to be argumentative. So remember that points of information are intended to, in some way, highlight flawed logic in your opponent's case. They're intended to make your other team, your opponents, look wrong. Points of information have nothing argumentative in nature. They are not attempting to expose your opponents. They're not trying to show why your opponents are wrong. None of that. All the points of information are trying to do instead is to clarify what the government team is arguing for and what the government team's definitions are. This means that points of information can only be asked realistically in the prime minister constructive. The reason I say realistically is that, one, there are some people that will tell you that you can use points of clarification for any time that you like are confused on an argument. I really disagree with this. Points of, of clarification really are only and exclusively used for definitions, so you should really only be asking them in the prime minister constructive. The real possible exception to this that people disagree on sometimes is that Opposition teams can do what's called uh, run a counter plan, which basically means that opposition takes a different stance than just opposing the motion. Uh, I'll talk about this probably in a different video at some point later on. But in theory, points of clarification could also be asked when the leader of opposition is introducing their counter plan. But don't worry about that too much right now. I've never actually seen that happen in a real debate. and I've done a fair amount of debate in my career. So that basically means the important thing to take away then is that POCs can realistically only be asked in the PMC. That is the extent to which POCs can be asked. Now, what do POCs actually look like in terms of what are their features and characteristics? The first thing is that they are off time. So unlike points of information, which when you ask them and when you answer them, all of that is while your timer is running. It is taking time away from your speech. Points of clarification, when you offer them, you stop time. The other really, really, really important thing about points of clarification is that they are mandatory. You must take them. And in all honesty, you can kind of see why, which is that they're off time. So it wouldn't make sense for you to not take them, right? Like, you, like the timer stops. Unlike points of information where your timer continues to run and you lose time in your speech, points of clarification are off time, meaning that if you, for example, are 32 seconds into your speech, when someone raises on a point of clarification, the, uh, the, the timer stops at that point in the debate and uh, the question and the answer to that question is not included in the time. So for example, if I stand up and I say, point of clarification to the prime minister, uh, the timer will stop. I will ask my clarificational question. I'll say, for example, you know, what, when you were defining the, the, you know, the term social credit system, I would, you know, what do you mean by this, right? 
The prime minister then has an opportunity to answer that question. Once the prime minister is done answering that question, that is when they can then delve back into their speech. That is when the judge and the people within the debate will resume their timers and the debate will continue from that point moving forward. The last thing to say is that when you want to offer a POC, uh, all that you basically do is you stand up and you say something to the effect of clarification or point of clarification, POC, something like that, just to signal that you're not offering a point of information. Lastly, points of clarification are not subject to the same temporal limitations as POIs. So unlike POIs, which cannot be offered during what's called protected time or the first or last minute of each speech, points of clarification can be. So you can offer, like obviously most prime ministers begin their speech with definitions. So in most instances, points of clarification will be asked within the first uh, minute of the prime minister's speech, whereas points of information cannot be offered within that time. Points of order are the last type of point in a debate. Unlike POIs and POC, either points of information or points of clarification, points of order are not questions. They are basically statements, and they are really used for when you think your opponent has broken the rules of debate. Now, the reason that point of order should be rare is because there are really quite few, uh, very few rules of debate. As in, there's like no like hard set set of rules or laws for how parliamentary debate ought to work, besides things like speaker time and the rule that you can't introduce new arguments and rebuttals. And so, unsurprisingly, points of order are most commonly used for those two for violations involving those two regulations and norms. So, in all honesty, this is very rare. But if your opponent is going way over time. So, you know, for example, their speech is eight minutes with 30 seconds grace, so they should be done by eight minutes and 30 seconds. If they're still talking at nine minutes, you can raise on a point of, inf a point of order, excuse me, and say, you know, excuse me, judge, uh, our opponent is 30 seconds over time and it's time for their, their speech to stop. And the second and the far more common way to, to apply a point of information is to raise on a point of information when you believe that your opponent has broken the other major rule of parliamentary debate, which is that they have raised a new argument in a rebuttal. So if you believe that your opponent has raised an actively new point of substantive or a new piece of content in a rebuttal speech, you do what's called raise on a point of order and basically explain to the judge why you believe that the material your opponent has been introducing in their rebuttal constitutes new material and therefore should be what's called scratched off the flow or put differently, should not be consider it in the debate. So the judge should not consider that point of argumentation when making their decision in the round. So what do I actually mean by this is that one, they are off time. So much like points of clarification, when you uh, when you stand up on a POO, uh, the timer stops, the judge stops the time, your opponent stops the time, all that sort of stuff. The second is that the judge will basically rule on the point of order. So as I was explaining earlier, when you stand up, you would say something like point of order, you would explain to the judge why you believe your opponent has inappropriately introduced a new point or a new piece of argumentation in their rebuttal speech. The judge then, this is really the only time in the way, by the way, that the judge will actually say something besides in between speeches by introducing the next speaker. The judge will verbally say something in response to the point of, a point of order that has been offered. So for example, if the judge agrees with you and thinks that the argument that has been raised is, as a matter of fact, new, they can say point is well taken. So if, for example, the PMR raises a blatantly new argument that is not responsive to any new material raised in the member of opposition speech, the judge might say point well taken. And at that point, that argument would not be considered in the debate. The judge would not consider that argument when making their decision. The judge could also say point is not well taken, meaning that they disagree with you. They do not think that whatever you think is new material is actually new. Uh, and then lastly, they might say point is taken under consideration. So this basically might mean, you know, I as a judge, I don't necessarily know if this is a new point or not. I'm going to consider this. And later when I'm making my decision, determining who I think won the debate, I'll consider then whether or not this argument is actually new. Now, the one thing to sort of note about this gen like generally, right, is that in the instance that a judge agrees with you, the importance of that is that the judge no longer will consider that argument when making their decision. This is really important because if you think about it, if you are, for example, the opposition team, when the Prime Minister rebuttal is speaking, you have no opportunity to ask points of information to that speaker, so you can't challenge them on a poor argument, right? But importantly, you also have no opportunity to respond to any arguments made in the Prime Minister rebuttal, which means that if the PMR introduces strong new arguments that could potentially win the government team the round, it is in your interest to point of order that speaker and to say, this is a new argument and it should not be considered in the context of the debate. That is what a point of order means, and that's how a point of order works.
Just in the way that when you offer a point of clarification, you stand up and say something like clarification, same thing is true with point of order. You stand up, you say point of order, you explain to the judge why you think that they've introduced a new argument, the judge then rules, and the debate continues from that point forward. The last thing I want to say briefly on point of order is that the person giving a rebuttal speech does have an opportunity to respond to the point of order by briefly explaining to the judge where on the flow they could find that argument, or explaining why it is a, why the argument they are introducing is directly responsive to material that was introduced in the member of opposition speech. So for example, they might say something like, under our second contention, we explained why this argument is true. And so a judge might check their flow. They might say, that is true. Point is not well taken. Uh, continue along with your speech. And once the, uh, once the speaker has finished speaking, timer then resumes and time continues. The final thing I'm going to talk about in this video is, the, uh, is what's known as flowing. And this is probably one of the few pieces of, of like one of the few terms that I'm going to use here that many non-debaters probably haven't heard of and probably most debaters have heard of despite whatever style you might be coming from. So flowing is ultimately just a particular type or particular variety of note taking that is used in debate that allows debaters to keep a written record of the arguments, refutations, and responses that are made throughout the course of a competitive parliamentary debate. The reason that it's called flowing is because when you flow properly, flow being the verb form of flowing, when you flow properly, the arguments should basically flow across your paper. So you should see arguments, responses to those arguments, and responses to those refutations. Now, in order to flow, all that you really need is a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. All that you really need to do is to have a sheet of paper you can write arguments down and have some sort of writing utensil to write those arguments down. And once you sort of have those pieces of material, you're able to flow. So how does flowing actually work? I'm going to try to draw it out on my screen. As a general disclaimer, I'm doing this with my cursor, which means this will be awful handwriting. It'll be very, very ugly, nor even if I had a real pen, am I a particularly good artist. So I apologize in advance for the awful thing that I'm about to attempt to draw on my screen. So how does flowing work? So envision, if you will, for a second that you have basically a sheet of paper that is horizontal. Again, I apologize for the awfulness in this drawing. Let me try to fix this and make it look somewhat, there we go. The first thing you're going to, going to want to do is to basically fold your paper in into four parts. Uh, and basically what this should give you is something like this. You should have four vertical columns on your paper. And then you want to fold your paper in half the other way such that you have, can I get rid of that? I don't think I can, I apologize. Well, let me continue doing this anyway. So. Uh, you want to have a line across your uh, across your paper. So you basically want to fold it such that you have eight individual boxes on your sheet of paper. Each vertical column will correspond to a speech. So this first column here, up and down, will be the prime minister constructive. This second column here will be the leader of opposition constructive. This third column here will be the member of government. And this fourth and last column here will be, will be the member of opposition. I'll explain later on how you flow the rebuttal speeches, the basic ways that you fold the paper back in such that the back sides of these two columns uh, are kind of folded over onto these two columns and you flow on the back side of the paper. Anyways, the basic way that you flow is that this paper is where you will write down all arguments, refutations, and definitions made in the debate. In the prime minister's speech, any definitions put forth by the prime minister constructive, so for example, when they define this house, should be written into this bottom box here. So this bottom left-hand corner of the flow paper is where you write in any definitions. So you, for example, in this box might write down, you know, this house is equal to, I oftentimes, you know, use an equal sign just to save some time, you know, say this house is defined as the United States federal government, which you might abbreviate as the USFG. Maybe then you would define other terms, and if they have other terms, you would write them down in this bottom box here. In this top box here, still within this first column, that is where you will write down the two to three arguments that the prime minister constructs. So you, for example, might write down, you know, their first argument is about the economy, their second argument is about social stuff, their third argument is about politics, right? And so you would basically write down each of their arguments, and then in the space between arguments, you would basically write down what is their claim, what is their warrant, what are their warrants if they have multiple, if they have multiple logical reasons why an argument is true, and what are their impacts, what is the impact of that argument, why is the impact important in the context of the round. And you do that for all of their arguments. The leader of opposition speech, you would then, in the bottom portion here, 
The first thing you would do is that if the leader of opposition has any challenges to the, to the definitions, uh, so if, for example, they think the definitions are abusive, if they think they are unfair, if they think that they are non-topical, if they think that they don't make sense in the context of the resolution, they can do what's called challenging definitions and saying that we should reject these definitions, like I kind of mentioned earlier. And you can more or less flow any responses to definitions in the top part of this box here. Now, below that, uh, assuming that they accept definitions, of course, this bottom box here, right, this second box on the bottom here, is where you will write down the opposition's arguments. Just as a general note, the government cases arguments will all be written uh, in responses to the government's the government team's arguments will all be written in this top row here. This is called on case because it is on the government's case. This bottom row here, with the exception of that box for definitions, will be where all our opposition arguments and responses to opposition arguments are made. This is called the off case because it is off of the government case. So this bottom row here is for the opposition arguments. This top row here is for the government arguments. So in this bottom box here, in this LOC, Leader of Opposition Constructive Column, this is where you will write down the two to three arguments made by the opposition team. And once again, you will write down whatever the, what's called the tagline of the argument is, whatever the basic claim of the argument is, and you will then uh, go into uh, whatever the claim warrant impact of each argument is, writing each down in the space in between each argument. Uh, and each speaker should do what's called signpost, which means that each speaker should, at the top of their speech, explain to the judge what they're going to be doing in their speech. They should, for example, say something to the effect of, um, in my speech, Judge, I'm going to firstly define terms in the motion and then advance three points of argumentation. I'll first explain, you know, whatever our first argument is, then our second argument, then our third argument. Maybe for the leader of opposition speech, you would begin your speech by saying, Judge, in this speech, I'm going to begin by uh, talking about the government team's definitions. Then I'm going to move into our three off-case arguments. And then I'll conclude my speech by refuting the arguments made in the prime minister's speech, something like that. This is called signposting, and hopefully all speakers should do it. And once you do that, you can have a better conception of where you'll be writing stuff down on your flow. Anyways, back to the important stuff here, which is flowing. After you write down the opposition's arguments in this bottom box down here, in this upper box here, directly across from the box where you just wrote in the prime minister's arguments, any responses or refutations offered by the leader of opposition constructive should be flowed in this second box here. And I like to use arrows to indicate direct responses. So if, for example, the first argument is about the economy, you might you know, point, you might draw an arrow from that argument pointing to this box, and whatever the leader of opposition says in response to that argument would go in this box here. Then, the member of government speech is next, and remember the member, member of government has two things to do. They first have to refute the arguments made by the opposition, and then they have to rebuild the arguments made by uh, the prime minister. Whatever order they do in is fine. They can do whichever order they, they prefer. I personally, as a member of government speaker, like to first respond to opposition arguments and then move on to uh, the on case, but that's just my personal preference. Either way is totally fine. Now, the way that you're going to flow the MG speech is very similar to how you flow the responses from the LOC speech, which is that the member of government speech should probably begin with something to the effect of the MG saying something like, I'm going to begin by refuting the opposition's arguments and then rebuilding my colleagues' arguments. So what you would do is you would, in this bottom box here, because remember the bottom row is reserved for opposition's arguments, you would write down any responses that the member of government offers to the leader of opposition's arguments, and you would write down those responses in this column, in this part of the column here. And then when the member of government rebuilds the arguments made by the prime minister, you would write whatever responses the member of government makes to the leader of opposition's refutations in this box here as well. The last speech of the round is the member of opposition, and you can hopefully see where this is going at this point, which is that you can kind of see how arguments are starting to flow across the page, where you had an argument, you had a refutation, and you had a response or a reconstruction of that argument, right? Here you had an argument, here you had a refutation, and now in the member of opposition speech, you're going to refute the responses uh, made by the MG, right? So in these rows here, whatever responses were made by the member of government, the member of opposition will directly respond to those. And the member of opposition also, remember, can directly respond to arguments made by the prime minister. So you might also draw arrows in here. Now, you might be wondering why I just spent a lot of time explaining what flowing is and how it works. Uh, and there are two reasons why. The first is that flowing is a huge part of debate. You need to understand how to maintain a good, solid flow, because that is oftentimes extremely important for your ability to win debates. This is especially true because, as I mentioned earlier, 
rebuttal speeches are oftentimes focused around the most important issues in the debate. The way that you understand what the most important issues are in the debate is by having a record of what the arguments were in the debate. The way that you have a record of what the arguments were in the debate is by having a written record of those arguments and the responses made to those arguments, which a flow paper is very helpful for. But the second reason why that you also want to maintain this is because when you are in a debate, you can what's called pre-flow what your speech might talk about. So for example, if you are giving the member of government speech, you might, as the leader of opposition is talking, talking, you might start to think about what might I say in response to these arguments. And you might start to write those out on your flow such that when you're standing up to give a speech, you don't have to simply think on the spot about how you're going to refute the opposition's arguments. You can have in advance an idea of what you're going to talk about. That is the main reasons why you want to flow and why this is a particularly good way of flowing. The last thing to explain briefly is how do you flow the rebuttal speeches? To be honest, you can do this in a variety of ways. There are some people that will have a different sheet of paper that they will flow the rebuttal speeches on entirely. The reason that you can do that versus these constructive speeches is because most rebuttal speeches are not directly responsive, i.e. most rebuttal speeches, at least good ones, aren't explicitly refuting particular arguments. They are instead engaging in the big picture of the debate, which does not require you to be drawing arrows on your sheet of paper. But what many people, including myself, like to do is to basically fold in these columns here, such that you basically have the back sides of these columns and then it is on those back sides that you would draw, that you would write down and you would flow the LOR speech on this side here and you would, you, would, uh, you would do the same thing for the PMR on this side here. And at the end of that, you will have a record of each speech, the PMC, the LOC, the MG, the MO, the LOR, and the PMR. And that will give you a generic overview of the debate, the arguments that were made in that debate, what each team did well, what each team did poorly, and what the major areas of clash or disagreement were within the context of the debate. I apologize for how awful and ugly this looks, but hopefully this was at least somewhat helpful in giving you an understanding of how flowing works. And that's ultimately parliamentary debate. Hopefully you found this video at least somewhat helpful, at least somewhat entertaining, hopefully. Uh, and obviously, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd love to talk about parliamentary debate. It's an awful lot of fun. Hopefully you found this useful and productive.